evening. My name is Florence from Live Sokala. Welcome to the first ever Cheltenham Change Conference. We are pleased that you are able to join us and take part. We are delighted to be holding this event and to see many familiar faces and so many new faces in the meeting. We have almost 75 people signed up, which is wonderful. I will hand over to Helen to explain some of the logistics for this online meeting. Thank you, Florence. Um, my name is Helen Down from Cheltenham Borough Council. As Florence said, it's great to see you all, and I'll just explain some of the housekeeping. You're all on mute um, to avoid any feedback on the line, so please unmute yourself if you do speak. Um, the event will last approximately two hours and we have a series of presentations and videos to share, followed by an opportunity for discussion in breakout rooms. The event is taking place live and is also hopefully being streamed live to YouTube. As you're participating in the event, please note that it's being recorded and broadcast and so you are consenting to the use of your image and sound recordings for broadcasting and training purposes if you do speak and use video. And please also check your background. The breakout sessions won't be broadcast, although they will be recorded so that we can share notes from them afterwards. You can use the chat function to share messages with me or with the whole conference as we move through the agenda and we'll collate all the messages. We also have a hashtag CCC 2020 Equitable Futures to share thoughts on Twitter. We now have a short video from the Black Lives Matter peaceful protest in June at Pitfield Park to set the scene. No justice, no peace. 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 You will be an earshot of a statement that's been made. And through your fear of confrontation, you will not address it, which means things stay the same. The confrontation you're running from could be saving somebody's life, okay? Your voice is really imperative from this moment going forward. It is up to you to change the narrative. We're fighting against racism. We're fighting against colorism. We're fighting against sexism, against fascism. We're fighting against colonialism, neocolonialism. The same attitudes that have led us here must change. Activists in Bristol pulled down a monument to Edward Colston, a slave trader who built a city on exploitation. There's a reason why I have played that footage more times than I've seen any slam dunk or any, any high that is. The statue being brought down taught more people about Edward Colston and the man that he was than the 125 years that it was put up. Black history is British history. We can't just confine black history to just one month. Let's teach the youth about the truth of colonialism in our schools. After today, in your own enclosed spaces, where a lot of times people feel safe, to say things that they don't say around others, now's the time to dismantle those statements. We all are gonna leave here and we're gonna go to our workplaces. We're gonna go to our schools, right? Systemic racism is in all our institutions. Most of our institutions were set up so many years ago. We want to find out how we move forward to make a better world for everybody. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It's all about the whole community coming together and doing something about it. Call for justice for Shukri Abdi, justice for George Floyd. Learn their names and learn their lessons. Black lives matter. Listen, black is beautiful, black is excellent, black is love, black is elegant, black is my favorite color, black books on my bookshelves. Daddy told us if they didn't teach us, then we should teach ourselves. Mum must me a sheer butter, so I try and love myself. Please don't touch my head, it's like taking our wealth. Dave said the truth, they are raising it. So I talk to mum and dad, my family tree, we are tracing it. Black is the future, me and my sisters, we are making it. Sports day last summer, the gold medal, I was taking it. <laughs> Black 
We'll now pass over to Councillor Flo Klukas for the opening and welcome. Well, thank you, Helen. Gosh, isn't that a powerful video? When I look at that and I notice on it just one plaque and it read, only white people can fix racism. And what a powerful message that is. First, however, I would like to thank Florence Nayasimo Thomas and Dr. Germain, Germain Revalier on behalf of Cheltenham Council and all our residents for their work and commitment making things change. I'd also like to thank Bernice Thompson. I don't know if she's here, but she held the first conference uh, earlier in the summer, which began the process of addressing some of these issues. I don't know how many of you have actually been on the YouTube channel that has streamed some of the comments that people have made in relation to this conference. But I, having seen those people on there who have made testaments in relation to how they feel about living in Cheltenham and how things matter to them, there were five that came to mind. The first was Reem, a Syrian refugee who's been here because she needed to escape war and keep her family safe. Mary, who has been here some 20 years and been an NHS and social worker. Knife, who's an author, lives here, is married with two children. And then Mr Saunders, who works in education, made a powerful statement about the attitudes of some in education to black children. And finally, Munrusha, who was abused and insulted in Pitville Park. And I watched those and I thought, this is the 21st century. We should be beyond that. And that's why I'm so proud that Cheltenham Council agreed to stage not just this conference, but mechanisms by which we could make change happen. Because if we don't make change happen, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we will be having the same argument. So change has to happen and we have to be the instigators of it. We are privileged as a council to be here working with both you, Florence, and you, Jermaine, and with Lives of Colour in this matter. But we want this to be a positive and certain route to change the way things are for our Black, Asian, and minority ethnic residents. And I look forward to four things. The first is listening to what is said today. The second is learning from what is said today. The third is understanding what is being said to us today. And the fourth is hearing how we can change the way things are to give everybody here a better future. I'm not going to go on because I want to hear what you have to say. And so what I'd like to do is thank you all for being here. Please feel free to contact me at any time if you have an issue or a problem. And we will, as a council, be determined where we can, we will make change to make Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Steve Frost once wrote, once wrote, diversity is a reality, inclusion is a choice. We can't change our imperial history, we can't change our colonial history. We can't change travel, we can't change cultural exchange, nor should we want to. Instead, it is up to us, every one of us, friend, neighbor, boss, teacher, CEO, or employee, to choose to create an inclusive society. You might be thinking, oh, what am I going on about? 
We've got diversity and inclusion policies. We've got diversity and inclusion managers who deal with this. Well, my point of view is that if that's the case, then why are we here? We need to review our organizations and how we're doing, how impactful our diversity and inclusion managers and officers and the strategies that we've got are for an organization. We all need to work together and most importantly, the inequalities that many BAME community face needs to be led from the top to the bottom. Representation. We need to see BAME people represented within executive board, within the board and management in all our organizations and institutions in order to have different thoughts, people from different backgrounds influencing policies that are inclusive. Otherwise, it's still the same thing, the same people, the same faces, no change. Recruitment and retention. To keep the talent that our organizations already have, we have to offer progression pathways, mentoring and training opportunities for our BAME communities to be able to break the glass ceiling. How we recruit? We can't use the same ways that is the norm. Engaging with BAME community, we know is difficult, especially when you're living in Gloucestershire, and say, most organizations say, where do we find them? But that's not the case, because I've proven through Lives of Color that if you engage with the community the right way, you can do it. For example, I worked with um, the Museum of Gloucester just this year, whereby Bayton community never used to visit. But until we had our exhibition there, which was the Our Migrate exhibition, within two weeks, almost a thousand people had attended the exhibition. And more importantly, there had been people who had lived in Gloucester, Gloucester for 50 years and never knew where that space is. So it's the way you engage with the community. It's not the community to change, it's the institution to change their approaches in how they engage with the communities. Resources. We have to ensure that BAME networks and BAME people are visible in the spaces we are. Things like Black History, has to be alive in all our organizations. Yes, you could have three people, four people, but any information that is out there that we can engage with is good enough to inform people of the inequalities and barriers that BAME community face. Information and up-to-date information. I was really surprised that this summer, one of the team members that we had said that she attended a diversity and inclusion clubs, which was online. Fantastic course, she said, but when it came to race, it was only one page. And it was, what is racism? And that was it. And this is this summer. And she said, Florence, if I didn't know what you do, or if I wasn't involved in this process, I wouldn't have known any different. What does that tell us about our system? We have courses and training courses that say they have to be local authority authorized. So what does that tell us about that? If we want to tackle racism, inequalities, we have to choose to make decisions for equitable opportunities for an inclusive world. For my experience and others, with the, who work within the community settings, when BEM people are asked to give advice, it is expected to be free, but when others give the same advice, it comes with a fee. We need to think about that. When I was, uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, when I was preparing for this conference, my mom lives in Kenya, I live here, I've lived here for a while. 
So I spoke to my mom and said, oh, I'm preparing for this conference. And she said, oh, what is it about? And I said, it's about race. And she said, oh, you should be good at that because Kenyans are very good at racing. That is how I grew up. Racism was never in my vocabulary. Systemic racism was never in my vocabulary. Social injustice was never in my vocabulary. When I came to live here 30 years ago, I only saw opportunity of education, opportunity of profession, opportunity of life and family life. This year, I've been in Chatham for 18 years. And it's been fantastic. Yes, I mean, using the English word, there's bad apples somewhere there, but that is life. I was, uh, I was glad to have come to live in Chatham, studied politics and community development, and did a course, my, my, my dissertation on community cohesion. And I'm glad to say, well, not really glad because if I knew then what I knew now, I might have written a different paper. But I'm glad to say that two people I interviewed on my dissertation those years ago are here today supporting this event, and that's Richard and Bernice. You know yourself. So I must have done something right. In 2013, I found myself propelled into leadership as African Community Foundation, and with that, we started Black History Month event. It's now seven years on that this is an annual event in the uh, calendar within Chatham and Gloucestershire. We've been going for two years. Three years ago, I made a speech at the launch of Festival Hall in Gloucester Cathedral about diversity and inclusion. And a year later, launched Lives of Color. This year, though, was different. And we all know that. COVID-19 happened. The death of George Floyd happened. And the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement has reminded us and reminded me in person what my journey has been all about. It's given me this purpose. So I'm really honored to have you join us at this conference today. I founded Lives of Color as an organization which aims to elevate the voices of marginalized community by working with the individuals, communities, and organization. I've been working with Child Ambara Council and Child and Welcome Refugees and the community members to bring you this conference. We are even, we've invited policy and decision makers, thought leaders, and heads of organization to discuss this topic based on the title, Transforming Diversity and Inclusion, Progressive Action for Equitable Future. But what do we mean by that? I've already touched on diversity and inclusion, what we mean. That what, let's go on progressive action. Progressive. When we say progressive, we mean social reform. And by reform, we mean drastic change. As it is, system as it is, as we've seen, is not working. And ticks box exercise is not good enough anymore. This is about bringing the community together to form a grassroots approach. This is listening to the concerns of the community and creating lasting change, lasting solutions. When we say action, we mean having a plan. Because we know that there's no quick fix. It's not going to be fixed tomorrow. It's not going to be fixed after this conference. We have a lot of work to do and the, to find the best solution for equitable futures for all.
When we say equitable futures, we mean systemic results-driven change. This is an opportunity to ensure that next generation of Black and Bain children that pass through our schools do not have the same experience as those who have come before. We are all here today because we recognize that we have making a commitment to solve it. For that, I am really grateful. Our children deserve to have equitable education. However, in Gloucestershire, if you're Black and Afro-Caribbean, you are 5.6 times likely to be excluded in school, according to the research by Integrated. What does this tell us about where we live? Clearly, we need to be doing better for the culturally diverse communities among us. At Lives of Color, we offer diversity and inclusion training. We have an inclusive book club, which is Authors of Color for Schools and Families. And we are working in partnership with other organizations to launch a Young Leaders Program and are now looking for mentors and funding. But there is plenty of room for more projects, initiatives, organization to help in this mission. So as we go to the next stage, we'll hear more from the community. But I just want you to be open-minded about one thing. And to explain this better, I have to tell you a story. Go back to my mom again. <laughs> She lives in Kenya. My mom went on holiday into Italy. And my daughter, one of my daughter, I've got three daughters, but you know, went to on holiday with her to Italy. So these are two people who live, who love each other, but live parallel lives. So when they were out in Italy, my daughter wanted to have, you know, engage in you know, thinking about climate change and how this affects us. So she asked her grandmother, Nana, what do you think about climate change? My mom, who doesn't live in Europe and does nothing, you know, she, she knows what she knows, turned to my daughter and said, in Kenya, the weather is really good. It's sunny and it rains. But the only thing is that this year it was dry, so we didn't have enough maize. These people were speaking the same language, but totally in a different way. So when we think of racism, until they live, they start understanding each other, they love each other, they care for each other. Then my daughter thought, oh, this is, you know, I go first, she told me, she got frustrated that her nana didn't understand her. So she just said, no, I had to stop that conversation. It's, for me, it's the same conversation of racism. We have to be open to learn. There's lo lots of allies who care about the issue. We know our neighbors, we know people around us but we have to be invested in the journey of learning about each other. And it's not a one day fix. The more we learn, the more we get to know, the more we grow with the idea. Just like if my daughter and my grandmother lives in the same place, then they will understand why each other cares about climate change in a completely different way. With that, I'll leave you to Alan, who will introduce the next app. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll now share an inter uh, a video of a poem by Carol Francis McGann. You called, we came in ships bigger than anything we had seen, dwarfing our islands, covering them in the shadows of smoke and noise, 
crowded, excited voices filled the air. Traveling to the motherland, we're going to England. Over weeks, over oceans that threatened to engulf us, driven by a wish, a call to save, to rebuild and support efforts to establish health for all in the aftermath of war. You called and we came. Women and men of positions and qualifications in our homelands. Nurses with a pride in the excellence of our care, with experience in teaching, management, organization, and a sense of duty, we appeared. Smiling and eager to work on the wards, the schools, communities, and clinics of this England, our motherland. You called and we came. Our big hearts, skillful hands, and quick minds, encased in skins of a darker hue, which had shimmered and glowed in sunnier climes, but now signified our own difference. Matrons became assistants, nurses became chambermaids, all the while striving to fulfill our promise to succor, to serve, to care. The blue of the sisters' uniforms seemed as far away from us as the moon, unreachable by our dark hands in this cold land. But we were made of sterner stuff. The hot sun, which once had beat down on our ancestors when they too left their lands, shone within us, forging our hearts and minds with the resistance of ebony. You called and we came, rising like the phoenix from the heat of rejection. We cared, we worked, we studied, and we organized until the quickness of our brains and the excellence of our care made it very hard for you to contain us. And slowly, so, so slowly, the blue uniforms that had light bodies now had dark and lighter bodies beneath them. The professional care in our touch was valued, despite the strangeness of our speech, the kinks in our hair. You called and we came. A new millennium, new hopes spread across this land, new populations engaging and reflecting the varied, diverse and vibrant natures, nature of these shores, challenging and reflecting on leadership for health, moves to melt the snow at the peaks of our profession, recognizing the richness of our kaleidoscope nation, where compassion, courage, and diversity are reflected in our presence and our contribution. Not only the hopes and dreams of our ancestors, human values truly needed to lead a change and add value. Remember, remember, you called, we came. You called, we came. Hello, sorry, video to video. <laughs> we'll now hear an interview with Reem, who's a Syrian refugee living in Cheltenham. My name is Reem Al Awad. I am from Syria. I have been in Cheltenham for two years and uh, I come with uh, my husband and my children. My uh, daughter have uh, uh, six years and my son five years. At the first impression, I found uh, Cheltenham a nice view the first time. And uh, after a uh, uh, time, 
uh, I found it, uh, I discovered some people, uh, yes, I, but I found, I found it's uh, very good. I feel uh, strange, uh, you know, but uh, sad and happiness together. Sad because I am far from my family, my dad and my mom and uh, my uh, sisters and brother. It's merged with the happiness when I found a new, a new house, uh, far from war, far from danger, fear. So this is make uh, my feeling uh, confusing. To save my family, I come and I decided uh, to face every difficulties. When I come, I found some difficulties with my neighbor and uh, sometimes cannot uh, uh, maybe coexist, but I, uh, I try. We are as uh, Arabian uh, families, we used to be so more social uh, with neighbor and uh, other family, maybe the, uh, near uh, my house. So when I decided to, to speak with my uh, neighbor, for example, I found her, uh, she is fear or uh, uh, feel, uh, feeling me that uh, I am strange. Especially when uh, see me uh, uh, wear scarf, maybe as a refugee, maybe I don't know what she think, but I have uh, some problem about that. Now is uh, is increased my fear uh, when I walk in the street. I fear uh, someone attacked me, like friends, you know. I fear uh, so much about that. At the first time, my children very glad and happy and uh, maybe delighted because uh, new new school. Sometimes uh, um, when I speak to my son, for example, uh, uh, she, he said to me, nobody uh, play with me. So this is make me very sad. Nobody uh, work, uh, uh, work or, or uh, playing with me. This is a big problem, especially in uh, uh, son, uh, my son. So he is very little to, to speak about that. Uh, maybe I am a fault about that, but uh, I found a little bit, not so much. My name is Rim. We'll now hear from Tabitha Joy. Hello, my name is Tabby Joy. I work with Cheltenham Welcome to Refugees. Um, we frequently work with people who live on the absolute threshold of poverty. And once a person falls into poverty, it's incredibly hard to climb back out of it. We find that debt breeds debt, it charges interest. If you miss a dentist's checkup within a few years, you can expect cavities, you can expect root canals, extractions. If you can't afford the bus or a car, you can't take up a job in town, we have credit cards, paying off credit cards future spiralling downwards out of sight, and we're all of us in debt. Um, our phones are on contracts and our cars on leases, and we can see similar uh, like examples of poverty in some ways with some of the people that we end up working with. The people that we work with actually have dreams of futures as vets or as police officers or dentists. They, they hope to join their families here or, or create families of their own. But the people that we work with seeking asylum, they're given £150 a month in allowance to subsist on, which is far below poverty wages. That allowance of £150, that's around £37 a week, is to buy food, toiletries, is to pay for clothing, is to pay for transport, which takes you to English classes and to legal appointments. And some of these appointments are held in Wales, in Scotland, in Cardiff and Edinburgh, for which you will need coach travel, overnight accommodation. So you can, you can immediately see that that eats up an entire month's budget in a matter of two days. Um, we're seeing people who are fighting for recognition to live here, but fighting to survive fundamentally while they're doing that. I myself have worked in places that are barely refugee camps. They're just clusters of people living under bridges. They're living in tents that are cut up and contaminated with police who have pocket knives and pepper spray. I've met with people who have literally nothing. They can come to the, to the UK with everything that they've owned taken away from them. They've lost people that they've loved. They've, they sometimes have nothing but the clothes on their back. They've, they've had things taken from them. You know, people who've had um, laptops and mobile phones taken away. Um, you know, li literally 
possessing only the legal right to seek safety here, which they absolutely do have. Poverty is really absolute reality. It actually is a condition for most people now living in the global south. Many of these people with climate change and with increasing instability geopolitically, they may eventually become refugees living here in Britain. And it is their inheritance of the acts of colonialism and imperialism the British people have perpetuated over centuries. It still exists in concrete form. We can still see it. We can still see that Liverpool and Bristol were built on the profits from the slave trade. Um, these are undeniable realities. Just across town, houses in Pitville have been owned by slave traders. And we really have to face the reality of this. It's absolutely key. It's absolutely essential. We have to work to be bold enough and strong enough to accept the great things that truly been done to vulnerable people across many generations and across countries across the world. We, can, we, we have to deliberately untangle the repercussions of our history and try to create active reparations. Until that point, we won't have equality, we won't have fairness in our society. We've seen just across the last couple of hundred years, whole languages being extinguished. We've seen cultures annihilated. And, you know, when you think about it, surely we can reduce black maternal mortality, which currently stands in the UK at five times above the average for white women. We can develop scholarships and for BME students and just make sure that they're not excluded from schools. We can plan our cities to avoid gentrification, which shuts people out of housing. We can ensure fair and equal access to services. These are very small measures compared to the way we have extracted wealth from countries and put those countries into voracious and ever reinforcing debt. China Welcomes Refugees is my own organisation that I've been working with. We've been working for the past five years to create this very strongly affirming atmosphere of solidarity and support for refugees and the people seeking asylum who've made their homes in Cheltenham. Cheltenham is a very small and vibrant town on the edge of the Cotswolds, but it's become a place of second chances. It's become the centre for re-envisioning lives after years spent in exile and in refugee camps where conditions are squalid, in prisons even. We've been able to coordinate some really, really ambitious resources just on a shoestring budget. It doesn't cost a lot of money because we have incredibly generous supporters, people who understand these issues and really want to make a difference. We've been offered venues, you know, that help us to give community events, language classes, monthly cafes. We've had donations of furniture, clothing, and bicycles so that our people seeking asylum don't have to pay for bus fares, which cut into a huge amount of their allowances. We've had volunteers who really give up their time to help families feel welcome and safe. And we're trying amongst ourselves to find ways to improve the prospects considerably of those who live with this pet legacy of pain and devastation. And it really doesn't take a lot, it takes kindness and commitment. Taking anti racist action in our society is something that profoundly benefits all of us. It's undeniable, it strengthens us. It is direct investment into our communities. It is learning and it's having faith in one another and uplifting one another. It is our responsibility to do this. It is our job. It is basic human decency. It is the debt that we ourselves owe. It is, you know, moral poverty that we are seeking to address. And we urgently need to face up to paying off this debt. But after all, it really is a privilege. It's a pleasure. It truly is. Through my own role at CWR, I've really met some of the warmest, funniest and most talented people my life it's been an absolute joy to be able to work with them and it is a joy to see them flourish it's really wonderful to be able to offer them hospitality and opportunities and it's a pleasure to see them grow and help see, see them build futures for themselves and i really hope that many other people might be able to participate in this process alongside us thank you thank you tabby and um, we now have a video to share from mary mackie who's a social worker my name is Mary Mackey. I have lived in Cheltenham for about 20 years. Uh, born and brought up in Kenya, came here as a student. Um, I was a student at Florence at the University of Gloucestershire. When I finished that course, I, I worked with the NHS uh, mental health services for about 12 years. I retrained and did a master's in social work, and now I work for children and families. I want to hold on to the good things that happen within children's services. <laughs> Because we, we get a very bad press, isn't it? We, I, don't people, I don't think people really appreciate how much work goes into, into working with children and families. And some families can be quite complex. For us, we're still just working. We're doing the same things that we did before. The only difference is that probably we're working more from home. But we're still going into families' homes. We're still seeing children face to face. It's things as usual for children's services. Every child is seen. No child is left at risk. So we need to understand one thing in terms of um, 
the BAME community. In this country, there's only 14% of people who are BAME. But then if you look, for example, in just the prison service, 25% of just the BAME community in the prison services are open to mental health uh, services in, in prisons. So that's a very high number. Then you ask yourself, why is that? Why are they getting that service in prison? but they're not getting that service when they're not in prison. So what's, what's happening there? So we need to understand that uh, black and ethnic minority families, a lot of them are predisposed to uh, mental health problems and that there is social determinants that affect that. So when, when we uh, think about those social determinants, we think of things like uh, poverty. We think of things like racism we think of things like migration. Migration is massive in terms of that experience of migration. And also the expectations versus realities of migration because a lot of people came into this country. The expectation is not what they actually thought it's going to be. In terms of understanding why are they, did they not access mental health services before they went into prison, uh, we know they're overrepresented in prison. We need to, to, to look at some of the things in terms of accessing services. One of the things that BAME community find very difficult in terms of accessing services is language. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, I, I, I grew up in a country where we spoke English from the time we were young, English was taught in schools, but a lot of the people who migrated into this country did not speak any English. So you will find that, for example, Bengali community, Pakistan, people from Pakistan, uh, there's a lot of them who don't speak English. So universal services, so that is the primary mental health care. So I'm talking about the pathway where you first go to, to access services. It will be your GP. So they'll go to the GP, but my, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know how much it's funded in terms of accessing uh, uh, an interpreter. They would go there, they would say what they're suffering from, but then sometimes they get misdiagnosed. For example, I am from, from the culture I come from, we're very expressive, so I'll go to the doctor and I'll say, I'm depressed, but I'm making all these gestures. And the doctor will say, hmm, I don't think that's depression, I think that's schizophrenia, because I'm manic, I'm all over the place. So there's been a lot of misdiagnosis because of... Uh, just um, professionals not understanding our culture, they're not sensitive to that. What is crucial to me more than anything else is the stigma behind cultural norms of what they perceive mental health to be. I come from a country where if I saw anyone with a mental health problem, they would be at their worst. They would be really unwell. And for me, if any, when I came into this country and I got a job in the mental health services and somebody said, oh my God, you're going to be working in a ward, in a mental health ward, my goodness, I was thinking I can't because what in my cultural understanding of mental health problems is at its worst. And I'm thinking it's because it wasn't treated early. So a lot of people will not uh, access those services because of the stigma associated to mental health uh, problems. So there's a lot of barriers in people accessing these services. I will now hand over to Jermaine Valio. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Dr. Jermaine Valio. I'm an academic. I work in Bath, but I, I live here in Cheltenham. I've lived here for a too many years, too many years that I care to account. Um, but what I'm going to do is, uh, I, I'm also a local council candidate as well. I should put that out there. But what I'm going to talk about today goes beyond party politics. And I think that was one of the first things that I said in one of my local party, uh, one of my local council um, discussions. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk not necessarily about Cheltenham, although there is going to be one specific exception. I'm going to talk about national statistics and I'm going to look at the impact of oppression and systemic racism on children and young people in particular. So in the UK, children from an ethnic minority, minority background are disadvantaged from birth. In fact, it's before it comes before birth, but we'll start with birth. 
Office for National Statistics uh, evidence shows that six in every 1,000 black children in the UK die within infanthood. You compare that to uh, the general national, stati national statistic and it shows that actually that's double the UK average. So twice as many black, young black children die soon after birth. And the reason for that isn't genetics. The reason for that isn't down to race. The reason for that is, as the Office for National Statistics say, due to socioeconomic status and to living in deprivation. It also kind of just giving birth to children also affects mothers disproportionately, black mothers disproportionately. So black mothers, according to Morris and colleagues who, who, who conducted a few studies on this, black mothers are five times more likely to die during childbirth. Now, think about that. That's not a, because there is a biological difference between black mothers and white mothers. That's because White mothers are more likely to be listened to than black mothers, and this is academic uh, research. Black mothers are less likely to be listened to. There's the signs of symptoms of distress during pregnancy and during birth are less likely to be acted upon by healthcare professionals. But if a child survives infanthood and the mother survives birth, we look at education and we look at school. So for me, education is seen as a pillar of the community. Now, there's nothing more important for children and for young people than their education. But we know that if we look at secondary schools, for example, black children from a, from a standing start, and in particular black Caribbean children, from a standing start perform worse at secondary school than their peers. And you know it's a standing start because you have stats in year six, right? So you know where a kid is at the end of primary school. But let's say they get the same grades as their peers and they go to the same university. And again, we know that when you enter university, you're entering with more or less the same grades. So if you want to go to medical school in anywhere, you need three A's, right? You all need the same grades to get. So let's say that a bunch of black kids and a bunch of white young people get into medical school. Black young people are significantly more likely to receive a, a, a tutu or a third, so that's a C or a D, than young white people. When we think back to school, you think of uh, something that Florence reflected on right at the start. Black children across the UK are three times more likely to be expelled from school than white children. And this is the time that I'm going to mention Cheltenham and Gloucestershire more widely because Gloucestershire has the highest disproportionate, the biggest disproportionate in numbers of black children who are expelled across the county. And the problem with that is it's not just schooling. As I'm sure a good friend of mine, Teddy Burton, is going to say a little bit later, People have, have equated being expelled from school with, you might as well just send them straight to prison. The relationship between being expelled from school and things like going to prison and, and uh, being placed in social care are huge. Black children are therefore 10 times more likely to be placed in care. And these two things, just being expelled and being in social care, have a really strong association with being placed in prison and latterly with having poorer housing, lower socioeconomic status, poor job, poorer job prospects, etc. And you can see it's a recurring cycle. So those families who may have, may be in a lower socioeconomic status, maybe directly or indirectly because they were placed in care during uh, schooling or because they were expelled at school, They're less, their children are le more likely to be affected by all of these things that we've just outlined. 
But the last thing I want to say is, I, I could talk about this forever, but the last thing I want to say is that ultimately, by improving situate the situation for any one group, I genuinely know and I believe that improving the situation for any one group will improve the situation for all marginalised and oppressed groups in this country. And that's why I think this conference is so important. Thank you, Jermaine. Uh, we now have a short video from local resident Nave Pierre. I'm Nave Pierre, uh, also known as Nave or Pierre, that's my actual name. And I live in Cheltenham um, with my husband and my two children. I got my first job um, as a graduate working for Gloucester Guild Hall, which was fun. It was a great introduction to life in Gloucestershire. Uh, and its amazing riches of culture and heritage. I'm an artist at heart. I love to write, I love to paint, I love to illustrate, I love to communicate stories actually with, with imagery and words. I left my job so that I could, I could follow my creative pursuits. The first uh, book project that I worked on was a collaboration with my, my brother who lives in Ghana. It's a children's book called Ears for a Crow. Lives of Colour have kindly made me one of their authors of colour, which is amazing. And it's a book that takes you across Ghana. So it's a great introduction to phonics and the alphabet, but also it's, a, it's the cheapest ticket you'll ever get to travel to Ghana. I remember being a child in the 80s and there was nothing, there was nothing. You know, I, I used to look at Ariel, the fantastic mermaid princess, and go, oh, I don't have red hair and I don't have pale skin. That must mean that I'm not, I'm not beautiful. And these were, the, these were the images we were bombarded with as children, that we weren't visible, uh, and yet we knew we were present and we knew we were there. So it's fantastic. There's been an explosion in the past, I'd say, five years or so of fantastic, rich, beautiful, diverse reading material for children. And the wonderful thing is that everyone can enjoy it. It doesn't matter what your skin colour is, you will enjoy books that celebrate things that you don't know about. We're all essentially curious. I think that's the, that's the heart of it. I remember attending the Winchester Writers' Festival in 2017 and presenting my book A is for Accra to a leading, a leading editor for a publishing house. What tends to be the trend for children's books is you get lots of, I suppose, white protagonists and lots of, lots of animals. And when I asked him why he wasn't, he wasn't publishing these books, he said they're quite niche. And I thought, well, you know, we self-published this book and actually we're, we're, we're selling it. And this is just off our own backs. We're able to sell this book. I think that the publishing houses, the, the institutions of publishing are really slow. They're the gatekeepers and they are responding now to, to uh, popular demand. Because as the more we educate ourselves, the more we, we do ask these questions. Well, why, why aren't there enough books for me to explore alternative histories or alternative protagonists or you know Diwali have just passed why why don't I have enough books to celebrate these things I'm Naif Pierre um, can we now hear from T uh, Teddy Barton the teacher I think we can hear you, Teddy, but we can't see you. Yeah. Not yet. Connection. We can hear you a little bit. Are you able to move any closer to your internet router, Teddy? Oh, we can see you. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, is the sound any better now? Yes. Oh, it's gone again. Yeah. <clears throat> Teddy, I think we'll move on to the... Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, and um, we'll now watch a video from Anthony Saunders, who's also a teacher. What success yet? That off the records, teacher said to them that most of the trouble that is in this particular school is caused by you black boys. My name is Mr. Saunders. Um, I have worked in education um, for some nearly 40 years now. Parents from time to time have asked me if I could give some support to their black boys in because they, they didn't have any 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 black any black dad around. those youngsters having a black person to a black man so to speak to you know to, to relate to first one I dealt it was a boy um, who had issues with um, racism at his school to be more specific this lad I've been working with didn't know his dad until uh, two years ago when he went to Jamaica he was on the verge of being excluded from school when he was in year nine. In fact, he got a, a final strike, one more, and he would be out. So I started working with him, and of course, with support from the mom, we were able to get the school to, to decide to keep him. He has always felt that the school was determined to, to, um, to permanently exclude him. And there are a number of other black boys that he shared with me that off the records teacher said to them that most of the trouble that is in this particular school is caused by you black boys. And we are determined to get rid of you. That was said to, 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 to him and some others off the record. So the procession that they have, along with other siblings there, is that the school was always out to get them because they were identified as the ones who caused the most trouble. And what I find is that um, I don't think the school gave the support that the school should have given because I, I raised that issue with at the governor's meeting with um, one of the, the deputy heads says, oh, yes, we gave some support, but she completely missed the point because the support that I was talking about that youngsters should be getting is emotional and psychological support. But then this is something that schools could do. When I was governor at one, the last school that I worked at, we implemented a mentoring program and it was funded by the governors. And we identified six students and we supported them through the GCSE. It cost money, but then at the same time, if schools consider the long-term effect and the society in general consider the long-term effect of a student being excluded, then they'll probably spend that money now than having the society spend that money later. Why not spend a pound now instead of the society spending a thousand pounds later to look after that young person in prison or some other serious issues that might befall them. So it, 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 is, it is not only schools need to be looking like that, and organizations need to be working with schools to be looking like that. Teddy, do you want to try again? Uh, 
Okay. Um... Oh, it's still a bad line, Teddy. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I think um, we will now hear a, from Tabitha Joy reading a parent letter. <laughs> This was a letter recently written um, for a girl who um, was struggling at her school. Um, Thursday, 12th of November, 2020. Thank you for your email. Having taken time to read and contemplate its contents, it is with a heavy heart that we feel we ought to write to you for the last time. School was our first choice for us, for us balance, full stop. We never imagined that things would turn out the way that they did. Of course, any parent would be upset and frustrated knowing that people of authority and trusted positions who should have been trained to identify a child's need chose to ignore it and left the child traumatized. Therefore, it's not right. How frightening it is for a mother to be just waiting for that phone call to pick up her child. These incidents happen several times, not just the one time as your findings did not even take into consideration the doctor's note about her anxiety. It's very, very sad that your findings have missed the point show no sympathy or even mention the well-being of best balance as this is a four-year-old child that has anxiety issues in a school environment and has been continually vomiting out of anxiety that she's been suffering because of the exclusion we have experienced school for it to understand what diversity and inclusion really mean for children from black backgrounds and their needs we will therefore strongly recommend that you as an organization look into resources that can help find a better way in dealing with these issues so that you can provide a more inclusive solution instead of prioritizing policies and national guidelines over the well-being of a small child. These will benefit you as an institution, so you can embrace the differences and handle these issues in a far more diverse and sensitive way. The good news is that we feel blessed by friends and family who have been helping and supporting us, and Esperance is receiving all of the support and compassion that she needs in her new school environment. So she is doing amazingly well, and we are grateful for that. This is it from us, we're done. So no, we do not intend to appeal to the clerk. Thank you and God bless. Kind regards, Angel and Lambert. Thank you, Tabby. And now finally, we'll hear from Florence Nayasamo thomas We've had um, quite a lot of stories. Um, just to um, go back to the letter that's been written, because um, the mother, parent of that child, specifically asked me for that letter to be read today. And she called me this morning and said, is the conference still going on? Please make sure you read that letter so that people can hear what I've had to go through. Anthony has touched on the exclusion and how young people in Gloucestershire, young brain people, the experiences of them. So it's not a standalone. But on the other hand, I'm sure that everybody who uh, signed on for the conference also received a link uh, from uh, Mrs. Blanche. Uh, this is St. Gregory's Primary School. And how um, in, the, in that video, if you ever watched it, they talk about how they've dealt with the racist issue in the school. And I'll give you an example, just in case anybody didn't find a chance to, um, to listen to it all. And she, she explains is that for one, or for instance, there was a child who called one of the kids that is stupid, the black child. And how they dealt with it is that they made this young boy or girl research three great black people made this child write about it, reflect on it, and then apologized. Racial literacy is really important too for our school. So it all doesn't have to be bad. We can ensure that young people learn in an environment whereby they thrive. So you've had stories 
that I've had from young black children, parents, adolescents, working in Chatham and studying. Some of you might think, hmm, so maybe it wasn't about race. Or some of you might think, maybe it was something else. Oh, that is just a cover-up. If that's you, and you're not really deep listening to the stories, maybe you could be the problem. As a society, we have become uncomfortable talking about race, uncomfortable with the thought that racism might still exist, and therefore comfortable in a society where racist comments, jokes, behavior go unchecked. But then, who is left uncomfortable? It is that ch new child in a predominantly white school that is teased for their weird food or fizzy hair. It is that university graduate who has to go through more application and interviews than their equally qualified peers before getting a job. It is that editor-in-chief of British Vogue, who just a few months ago was mistaken for a delivery driver by a security guard outside his own office. And it's also somebody like me. Somebody, most of you might think, okay, so what, what, why is this mean so much to me? Why am I here today? Well, I can tell you that it took me 21 years in this country. This is December 2011 for me to find out that I was black. What am I talking about? When I came to this country 30 years ago, yes, I knew I was African. Well, I came to find out I was African because by then I knew I was Kenyan and I was Luo. But I came to a country where it was full of, I, I was expecting opportunity, 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 every, everything that I set my, myself to do. And for that, I never understood the notion of knowing your station and still haven't up to today. I don't know what it means. When I grew up, I was told I could achieve whatever I set my mind to do and there was no barriers. I've watched a lot of young people grow up unsure of themselves. But on this specific day in December 2011, I was confronted with this situation whereby I had a boss who turned around and told me, if it wasn't me, you'd be a cleaner. And told me that, Sorry. And told me that if you dare tell or say anything, you know, you'll be sacked. I knew it was wrong. And as I walked home that specific day, I asked myself, what world have I brought my children up? Why did I come to this country? And I swore to myself, whatever it takes, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know which way I'm going to do it. I'll find a way to make it better, not for only my children, but for other young people out there. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. We're about to have a five minute break. That's the end of the presentations and videos. Um, so for those of you watching the event on YouTube, the stream will end while the meeting goes into a break and then discussion in breakout rooms. But if you open the link again at 10 past eight, you'll be able to watch the feedback and the summary of the event. For those of you that are in the meeting, we're about to have a five minute break. Uh, please don't leave the meeting, but feel free to turn off your video and sound. And uh, we'll see you back here at 7.45. Thank you very much.